the last um, <clears throat> couple of months and that I talked to Raina and Kerry briefly about this afternoon by phone. And that is the status of coming up with a final logo for the new identity of the Mountain Views Supervisory Union and Unified School District. Um, I, I'd just like to write a brief article about that and feature the article in the standard. I understand from chatting with Raina and with Kerry that there are various iterations of the logo as to how it's going to appear in different contexts, such as on school letterheads and things like that. But I'm interested in just letting the public know about what the main logo is. And so I'm wondering when that might be able to be released. I'm going to pitch that over to Bob Crean to speak to that. Um, I'm not quite sure I understand what you mean by released. Um, uh, Raina has, has them. They're, they're, she could send you copies of them. Okay. Um, yeah, Bob, I'm just speaking of the main the main logo again, not the whole kit identity kit as they call it in the graphic arts world of how it's going to be used in different situations. But I'll I'll reach out to Raina um, in the morning and and ask for a copy of that just to to share it with our readers. Yeah. the 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 logo is pretty much the same. Um, it's a a banner a banner logo and the the only differences are the text whether it be the supervisory union uh the woodstock union high school middle school or the individual elementary schools uh the logo was designed so that um uh it could be used uh, uh for all the individual schools and the supervisory union as well as the school district for correspondence, et cetera. Excellent. I think what we'll do then is we'll use the main logo for the supervisor union, maybe one of the samples of the school logo so that people can see how it's going to function in each of those contexts. And I'll, I'll just reach out to, to Raina to uh, make that happen, maybe publish yeah. a brief article next week. <clears throat> or, or you could look at the one that's, well, I'm not sure the Vermont Standard gets a so-called board book, but the she she can give you the whole nine yards. We have several different flavors, so that'd probably be the best. Yeah, the the, the one I saw on top of the board book, which I do get each month, um, is the one with the graphics of the mountain scene in the background and yep, that kind of thing. So mountain excellent. views. All right. Yeah, there you go. All right. That clarifies things. I'll uh, touch base with Raina and we'll uh, we'll get that word out there. Thanks a lot. Very, Bob. Good. Very good, Tom. All right. Thanks, Tom. Anybody else? All right. Um, we'll, yeah, I hope we do. Hi, Abby. Um, yeah, I would just like to express my concern about there being a turf field in the new school um, plan. Um, there are many places that are banning turf fields right now, um, including the town there, the city of Boston um, just banned any new turf fields from being built. And the NFL is considering banning turf fields um, and many schools are as well. So I don't think that that should be even considered in the new school plan. Um, I think grass fields are a much more sustainable option. Turf fields contain microplastics, um, PFAS forever chemicals that bioaccumulate in the ecosystem and um, cause cancer. Um, and I think that we should not be thinking about that in the new school build. Um, I would also like to mention that I think we should do everything we can to include a track um, in the new school build. I know there's been um, some issues with fitting it above the floodplain, um, but I really think we should do everything we can to fit it in the design. I think it would be a great benefit to um, the school as the assistant um, track coach. I can tell that tell you that we have a um, very large track team um, that would use the track as well as other teams that could use the tracks for workouts and community members, I think would really benefit from having a track in the community that they could use. Um, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, looks like we can move into the reports. And Sherry, we'll start with you. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, I did want to start. It's not in my report, but I 
there are often moments that I'm really proud of our students and our student population. And Assistant Principal Cody Tancredi shared uh, an incident uh, a couple weekends ago where our football team attended another town's uh, game and didn't wear their football shirts and went to support and learn about the football team. And I think it's just a great example of our students and their sportsmanship and um, their dedication to really putting the best face on their team. So I was really glad to hear that. I know Cody was there and so was Tom Emery and that our students really presented themselves well on an opposing team and highly competitive situation, but did a really nice job. Um, recently, uh, Carrie and Ben shared with me my annual superintendent's report uh, evaluation. Uh, I want to thank everyone for their feedback, uh, from the members of the board, uh, directors. Um, I really appreciate that opportunity to have an outside perspective on how I perform in my role and how I can do better. Um, this is now my fourth year, and I think it's um, I value the positive support I receive, but I also appreciate the suggestions and ways I can do my position better. So I thank everyone for that. Um, um, in the October meeting of the strategic uh, plan design team, we began the next phase, which is really identifying the core areas that will be included in the new plan. Um, from that, myself, uh, John Staten, and Raphael Adamek have begun um, mapping out what are the goals for the work for the strategic plan. Um, we will be bringing the um, priority areas and the goals with some of the strategies to back to the design team in December um, before we bring it back to the board. Our intention is that um, at the February board meeting, we'll give a rough draft of what the strategies, goals, priority areas are to the board with a full presentation of the completed strategic plan in May. Um, and then October 5th, which seems so long ago right now, uh, clearly over a month, uh, was World Teachers Day. And some a piece of the feedback that we received when we did our climate survey was we needed more opportunities to recognize our teachers and to like elevate um, and appreciate their work. So each teacher who was has been here for 30 years and they're six received a, a brass apple uh, with their name and number of years. Uh, those who were here for 20 years plus received a red apple with their name and number of years. And those who have been with us for two years or more received a green marble apple. So it was really a fun day to go around and to recognize, especially those teachers who have been with us for more than 30 years. Um, and to know that we have six, not just faculty, but our staff, um, one of our custodians at the high school has been here for more than 30 years and has had one sick day, Joe. Yeah. And, both <laughs> and that was only because he had to help his sister move. Right. <laughs> and he walks to work every day. He walks to work back and forth every day, rain, snow, shine. Yeah, we have an impressive team. So we hope to make this an annual event um, every year, World Teachers Day, to really uh, begin to recognize those teachers who have made such a commitment to our district. Thank you, Sherry. Any questions for Sherry? All right. Um, the next report is from the Director of Technology and Innovation. Good evening, everyone. Um, two things I wanted to share with you tonight. So um, cybersecurity <laughs> remains a big focus for our small tech team. So we've been attending a number of conferences and workshops. So Titus Percy and I um, went to a workshop that was put on by Google to show us some of the tools that are available within our suite of education. Um, workspace to, to be able to help improve our cybersecurity. And then the AOE and the Vermont National Guard sponsored an event um, that they hosted for half a day. And, and so we, we attended that. So we're taking a lot of this information and constantly thinking about how we can improve our cybersecurity uh, posture. And the other piece I wanted to mention is sort of the fall from last year. So last year we changed um, our, we revised our grading policy. So this year is the first year that um, students have been receiving grades in Alma and the first quarter report cards for seniors were just issued. Um, and so we're working on improving the communication and the grade entry and the understanding of all those pieces. Um, but I just wanted to thank uh, Sarah Cook and Garen Smale for their work and getting things up and running. Sarah did a lot of that work, and then Garen with a lot of the connections with how um, students and staff are understanding that work. Thank you. Any questions for Rad? 
will say it's been a pleasure looking at all of them, keeping track of my middle school and grades and stuff. So it is definitely a great program. Thank you. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, the Director of Student Support Services. I'm Shana Kalinsky. I'm the Director of Student Support Services. And I wanted to uh, focus on support staff um, tonight, in addition to the things that are included in the report. The support staff for my team, they're referred to as paraeducators, paraprofessionals, independence facilitators, and they work in concert with the other educators in the building to help students realize their access to education and meet the goals in their IEPs uh, and sometimes in their 504s and EST plans. Um, we have some real highlights that we were invited as one of 10 districts in the state of Vermont that Amanda Rank, the coordinator of student support services, is going with a team of two of our support staff members, one from elementary and one from the middle school and high school. Uh, as part of an NEA grant, they're going to Burlington uh, this week to take part in a development workshop for support staff to build their capacity, their professionalism, and also to help districts learn how to support uh, development of those staff members, which in turn, of course, addresses the needs of our students in our schools. So that's very exciting. We also have a really good um, PD happening on Late Start Wednesday that we have a very large group of support staff members attending, and it focuses on restorative practices and is facilitated by John Kidda, but was the brainchild of Lori Smith and Tom Emery uh, in the middle school and high school. And it's a fantastic opportunity. The office, um, this office has also been busy with state reporting about staffing, homeless data, and excess costs. Um, and that shouldn't be um, taken as our district overspending. Excess cost reporting has to do with what do we spend on the education of students who receive special education and accounting that accurately so that when we reach the threshold determined by the state of Vermont, we are appropriately reimbursed for those costs so that it's not putting an excess on our spending. Uh, and that's that's what we've been doing in our office in the last few weeks. Thank you. Any questions for Shana? All right, thank you very much. Um, the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. Hi, everybody. Jen Stanton, Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. Um, a few pieces to share with you. Um, the first one is the fact that the high school won a silver recognition on the College Board's AP Honor Roll. I believe in the past we earned a broad uh, recognition. What's interesting about this is some of the statistics that come along with this recognition. It's really about access, right? So when it comes to college optimization, it means that 23% of our students are taking five or more AP exams, right? And a lot of that is because the board is paying for one of those. So a lot of this particular honor roll designation comes from the fact that the school board has really supported students enrolling in these AP courses. So I wanted to share that and say thank you on behalf of the students. Um, we have a middle level survey happening right now for our middle school. Any families that have students in sixth uh, sorry, seventh, eighth, or ninth grade that attended the middle school. Um, there's a link here in the board report. We would love for you to fill out this survey so that we can do sort of a 360 review of our middle level program and make some steps to improve it based on family feedback. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to say that we are deep in our job embedded professional development where we have teachers engaging in ELA and mathematics PD with Patty Kelly and Julie Brown. Um, it's going really well. And I just want to say thank you to the principals for their support and to all the teachers for engaging. Um, and a lot of that will be happening on Mondays in service. And we're really looking forward to that. All right, thank you. Any questions, comments? Are they taking all five AP exams in the same year or is this like over the course of the So um, if they're, it would be at least one by the time they're in the ninth grade, ninth or tenth grade. So over over time. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so like, but we, we do have students who do that. I'm not surprised. Yeah. Maybe some are sending us to one. <laughs> Four. <laughs> I got to hit my max. It's impressive. Okay. 
Next year. Next year. Please. The mic is off, so they pee over here. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. And um, I will call on Aiden first because he's first in the report for our student report. All right, um, I'm hoping you guys can hear me. Uh, I've been having issues with my headphones, but um, I'll talk about a little bit more about the um, just the student well being of the um, and just the student body. Um, most some uh, there's been some really um, you know cheerful, happy events going on in the uh, high school and middle school. Um, I'm going to point out a few of them. The student council held, held their annual spirit week from uh, October 2nd to October 7th, which was, God, like a month ago, which feels like almost yesterday. Um, and uh, for spirit week, a lot of students dressed up um, in costumes and different uh, outfits that were themed towards us. Uh, uh, different days and different themes per day. There was sports day, Barbie versus Oppenheimer day, Western day, color wars day, and PJ day. And there's a lot of friendly competitions um, among students and among classes. And so it was good to see a lot of students get happy and excited about that. Following uh, Spirit Week, uh, the Student Council held the homecoming dance, which is a huge hit among high school students. And um, there was a lot of good feedback around that. And a lot of students who did attend really enjoyed it. Um, student Council also held their first Best Wednesday of the year, which was held on Thursday of Spirit Week, since that Wednesday was a two hour delay. Um, again, students participated in witness raffles, class competitions, and band and individual performances, which was a big hit among students. Um, looking more on towards academics, uh, sophomore and juniors um, took the PSAT, which was online for the first time this year, uh, on Tuesday, October 17th and Wednesday, October 18th. And it went pretty well for most students. I think students uh, really like the online switch, um, found it easier for a lot of students to do well. Um, and, uh, moving towards like athletics, um, a lot of, uh, teams performed very well in the fall season, which has pretty much come to a close. A lot of teams, we saw a lot of our teams perform really well in championships and senior nights and playoff games. Um, and the field varsity field hockey team made it to the championship, but unfortunately lost. And we are rooting for the varsity football team as they head to um, the state championship this Saturday. And also we have a few cross country runners who are heading to New England. So we wish them the best of luck. Thank you, Aiden. Any questions or comments for Aiden? All right, Owen, you are up. Um, so we had about 80 Woodstock High School students go to our uh, Student Leadership Summit, which is in its third iteration now. So that was really successful. I think broadly the whole group agreed that it was our best yet. So um, we were really happy with the turnout there. Um, we had 10 students from White River Valley and 10 from Hartford as well. So we're trying to grow it and make it more global than just our little uh, building, but I think we're on a good track there. Um, and we had some presentations at that event from Middlebury College's Vice President of um, EID, who's Dr. Karim Hussain, so he was great. Um, and we also did some breakout sessions that I think are particularly relevant to the board. So we worked on our district, um, our school code of conduct, which Aiden has been uh, also brainstorming on with Mr. Smale in the past couple of weeks. We also talked about offensive mascots um, and we revised our critical conversations manifesto. Um, so that was fun. So thank you to Ms. Souza and to our uh, school staff and the chaperones and also the student team that facilitated it. Uh, and also thanks Ray Rice for coming. Um, and on a fun note, I want to introduce Tess, who is going to be, she's going to wave awkwardly from the back. She's going to be our um, student council representative. So technically, we've been supposed to have this figure on the board for a while, but Ethan didn't really do it last year ever. So Tess is going to be here. Um, if she has something from student council, she'll come in, uh, talk, maybe during public comment. We can figure out how to work it in. But mm -hmm. um, it's just great to have someone from student council. So hi, Tess. That's what's up. Welcome, Tess. Thank you. Um, I think Ray wanted to make some comments about the uh, summit. Ray was our board representative. Uh, yeah, so I attended the uh, student leadership summit uh, October 11th. And um, honestly, I've been on the board for Pittsfield, I think, 13 years. I've 
been to a lot of events and I really got to tell you, you should try to go to one of these with these kids. It was uh, very enlightening. Um, Dr. Hussein talked about some really difficult things. It was right after the Israel Gaza uh, had just started that next Wednesday. And he has had a lot of personal experience uh, living with this whole thing it was uh and the kids were incredible um and uh so you know they really discussed some some heavy topics there for a bit you would uh not it took me by surprise i'll tell you that it really uh it opened up a lot there was a real lot of uh, conflict discussion um he's had a lot of things happen he's a great teacher i had lunch with him and uh you know from middlebury i want to give a Big shout out to the students who run that. That's Owen, Farron, Ella, Aiden, and Leah. And, uh, you know, they really put a lot of work into this thing. And um, like I've been to the uh, up to the conference, you know, and seen speakers there. And I got to tell you, it was it was highly, uh, highly recommend if you get a chance to go to the next one. Um, it was a good event. And then the, the mascot discussion really. Uh, was quite hilarious at some point so it was it was pretty worthwhile and um there was a lot of discussion there but they made this game that they were able to put up on the screen and owen was able to quickly get kids way into it the whole room was like playing this uh game that i had never seen obviously before I, <laughs> yeah, it was uh, you know but it was it was really good and uh um and I, I recommend it if you can get a time spent with the kids. It's really what this whole board stuff is all about. And uh and and so this would be a good one to go to. And thanks a lot for having me up there. I, I appreciate it. It's a good time and difficult too. Jesus. Thank you, Ray. Corinne. Hi, uh, you're on mute, Corinne. There we go. Um, sorry, I apologize if anybody else had comments for Owen or Aiden. I um, I couldn't find my hand, raise hand button, uh, but I wanted to ask Jen Staten a question actually. So I don't wanna like, if that's okay to go back yes. to that. Go ahead. Um, so I had sort of a, a sort of like, just high level question. Um, that was prompted by just a few opaque concerns. But uh, so obviously we are, we're doing amazing work with the curriculum development around ELA and then math, um, math this year and all the professional development that's going along with that, which has been, um, I think, really, really strong. Um, and I'm wondering um, what the, plans are sort of longer term plans in terms of um, looking at curriculum around the science and social studies uh, um, areas um, in the elementary schools in particular and and I think one of the one of the concerns that I've has sort of been raised for me in various you know minor ways is, is that you know we're doing all this really great work in literacy and math. Um, and we've set really, you know, concrete strategic goals around that. And what feels like maybe it's happening, you know, me, I'm not in the building, so I'm not sure is that, you know, some of the other areas, science, social studies, maybe in specials are, you know, often getting sort of trod upon because of the sort of strong goals we have in literacy and math. Um, so I wanted to just ask the question about, you know, again, sort of longer term, what is the thinking, um, you know, from your position on sort of developing curriculum or, or you know, how the re how science and social studies in particular sort of fit into that full framework for, um, you know, elementary schools and then obviously leading into middle and high, but yeah. it's a very general question, but I thought it might be a, a, a good time to raise that. Yeah, thank you for that, asking the question, actually. Um, what I, what I'll start by saying this. 
I'm very proud of our school district for prioritizing ELA and mathematics to the extent that it has. School districts are stretched very thin with demands for everything it has to be, they have to be excellent in. And we have created a priority at this time in ELA and math, and we're putting a lot of time and resources into it. We have established a new schedule in our elementary schools that reflects that prioritization. And at this time, as we're figuring out how to make it all work, social studies and science are not having the same amount of time that they had in the past. However, we have the opportunity to become very strategic about how to do those well integrated with ELA and mathematics. So at this time, we're sort of in a growth period where we're figuring out how to do it all really well while still maintaining those high priorities of math and ELA. Um, as a person that taught science for 20 years, it is certainly something that I feel is incredibly important. And um, I have conversations happening right now with elementary teachers who are reflecting that science is not happening the way it happened in the past. So we are figuring out how to make it all work. And meanwhile, um, our work is reflecting the district priorities. So it's not going away, um, but we need to figure out how to do it well. Thank I don't you. know if anyone wants to add anything to that. I think, <clears throat> and Corinne, again, good question. We are looking at, you know, we did some, we've done some phenomenal work in terms of strategic planning for literacy, strategic planning for mathematics. How do we repeat that with our other areas, social studies, history, social, emotional learning? Um, I'm working with the UA team to think about how do we become more integrated in our creativity with the arts? My in-service day will be with the UA team as we think about how do we um, continue to create a vision of integrated arts, bringing in that creative creativity, that joy, um, and, and realign some of the time so we can achieve the literacy and mathematics goals with a schedule, but not lose our vision for um, unified arts. And so that's the work I'm going to be doing. And myself, Mary uh, Guggenberger is part of that. Lori Beagland is part of that. Um, and so we will spend the two full in-service days having those conversations. We had a, a great um, day of principals visiting Killington Elementary School last week. And um, we got into a first grade class that was an ELA class where students were standing in a circle with a jump rope tied at one end. And they had to take this, this rope and figure out how to make it into a triangle using the perspective from above when there were 10 hands attached to the rope, right? That was the ELA lesson, but there was clearly mathematical thinking happening within that. We also went into another classroom where they were doing an ELA lesson. Um, however, they were reading segments of the Declaration of Human Rights and applying that to a fiction book that they are reading at the same time to understand how those human rights were reflected in that text. So what's really hard is we don't have like particularly etched out minutes but we have really rich integration happening right now. And we saw that at Mary's um, school and I, her hand was raised. So she may have something to say about that as well. Mary, would you like to add to that? I do. Um, I just wanna uh, put in a plug for ELA and uh, the EL curriculum that we're implementing this year. I was in a three, four combined classroom today during a, an EL lesson and the students were reading uh, books that were all about geology, and they could select their book from the ELL EL program selections all on geology. Third graders are reading words like confluence and divergent in their EL uh, lessons today, all about uh, geology. So science, we're learning more and more about how much science and social studies is in integrated into the EL program. It's pretty exciting to see. Thanks, Mary. Thank you. All right, thank you. And John, I wanted to ask if you'd like to give a report on the Rollins Foundation conference that you attended. Yeah, sure. So on what day was it? October 17th, maybe? Uh, I was invited by Kat Robbins to attend the Rollins Foundation conference, which they do annually. Um, 
for those unfamiliar, as I was, the, the Rowland Foundation has been around for I think 20, 30, uh, yes. quite a while. Um, and and they give out uh, grants and funding to uh, teachers and educators in middle uh, and secondary schools around uh, improving social climate and community in ways uh, to do that through curriculum and, and different things. Anyway, Kat and, and Janice Bobel had been uh, awarded funding for creating the craft program and they were presenting the work that they've done on that at the conference this year with three students, uh, one of whom was one of my daughters. So that was extra cool to see her present uh, in front of like 60 people. Um, and it was really inspiring to see not only the work that they've uh, been able to do uh, since the craft program began, but also uh, see how uh, uh, interested other schools were in uh, the programming that they've created. So uh, it was uh, up at UVM, and uh, I don't even know how many people were there, several hundred uh, from schools all over the state. So it was a very cool experience, um, and it was all about sparking joy in learning uh, and all that that entails. So there was a lot of joy. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Very good. All right. I think now we're going to, to move over to a presentation from the principals on bus transportation. Who is oh. presenting the slides? Maggie is going to. She's, she's I have them on my computer, but I think I need permission to share them. Raina will work her magic. Raina did. Rain emit work to imagine. <laughs> okay. Uh this is always a let's see. Is it sharing it? I can't tell. Yes. Yes, but you are oh. on your second slide, not your first. Pardon? We are on your second slide, not your first. Oh, okay. I uh, uh, I see. This I'm showing my what is it called Ludditeness. All right. I'm hoping all the other principals are going to chime in, and this isn't just going to be the Maggie Mills show. But um, we were asked by the board to give an update on transportation, so we just picked out some some positives, some challenges, and some next steps with our um, bus transportation experience this this fall in Mountain Views. Um, last year, the board adopted a clear procedure for adding stops and um, a criteria to go with that. And that has worked pretty smoothly this year to um, continue adding stops as needed. And as a result, there's been a faster turnaround from Butler's when there are stops requested. Um, we've had some really good instances of communication between Butler's and the schools regarding student conduct on the bus. Um, and at WES, we are one of the main pivot points for when students are transferring from a Reading bus or a Barnard bus to a Prosper Valley bus or a high school bus or vice versa. Um, and we've updated some things about how we do that at WES um, to improve supervision and just sort of the smoothness of how those transitions happened. And, and that seems to be successful this fall. I don't know if any other principals want to chime in here, or I can just move forward. Great, Meg. Keep going. All right. <laughs> okay, some communication challenges. Um, when a route is not going to run, often we're finding out at uh, 6, 630 in the morning as principals are transitioning to school, and we're getting messages from Sherry and trying to get those messages out in a timely manner when we may be en route ourselves. Um, so that definitely creates a challenge for our families when they're um, going out to bus stops and then things things change at the last minute. Um, a lack of substitute drivers certainly is one of the reasons why those routes aren't running. Um, we still have ongoing requests for additional stops. So that kind of changes the routes and can lengthen um, or adjust routes for families when, when people ask for more stops. Um, Several of the buses are quite full or at capacity, which creates a challenge when 
Um, there's an increase in riders or a request for additional stops. Um, and then the logistics when a bus is running late or canceled can be really cumbersome for, for schools and for families. Um, if a route is running late, that can really impact children waiting out at bus stops unsupervised or students getting stranded. We've had times when students get stranded at West, for example, um, because a bus doesn't show up or a bus is running late and then they're waiting, um, just kind of stuck at a, a transition point. Um, and that can be on, on the reverse too. Maybe they didn't know that a bus was canceled. They get to West and find out there's not gonna be a bus to get them the rest of the way home. So that's, that's a challenge sometimes. Um, in the past month, it's been pretty quiet though. So some of those challenges may have uh, resolved, but those were some of the early bumps we experienced this fall. If anyone wants to add, um, if not, I can move forward. Katie has her hand up. You're on mute, Katie. No. <laughs> I think it's my first time. Um, which routes are at capacity or near capacity? I know in the morning, I can only speak for buses that come through um, Woodstock Elementary, but the morning, um, Woodstock 3, Woodstock 2, um, and Barnard and Pomfret buses are all quite full. Um, and some of those can be affected by the seasonal changes with sports teams too, when sports are added or um, when the season ends, sometimes the buses lighten up or they increase because the sports have, have ended. Yeah, the other one would be the Killington High, High School bus is is rather full. So which route is not at capacity then? <laughs> <laughs> Woodstock 1 is a bus I know of that has lighter um, ridership. That's sort of the local in-town um, Woodstock bus, and it serves Tassville and then goes on to Heartland. That one is one of the lighter buses. And then in the afternoon, Woodstock 2 um tends to be a little bit lighter but i know that um it's it's more full when it's coming in in the morning i think reading elementary and killington elementary their buses aren't as tight as some of the other runs awesome. that, Thank that, you. that's correct for killing I, I think the killington elementary bus is more full at um at, in the p.m uh, because some students go to the library at the end of the day, that's the only time it can get full. But in the morning, um, there's there's room. There's plenty mm -hmm. of room. I would say our Pomfret and Barnard buses are quite full in the afternoon with students going to after school programs as well, either at the community campus or at artistry. I know at times there's students going to Saskadena for sports there as well. So we also have students who go to Prosper Valley for sports. Um, so that's the Pomfret bus as well. Thank you, Maggie. Okay, and some things that we continue to work on with the bus company, Butler's is our bus company. We continue to work on um, rolling over the routes year to year to maintain the current list and not start from scratch every year, but keep what we have and add to it and edit as needed. Um, continue to speak with them and communicate with them about the process we're using for adding um, stops for families. Uh, clarify with them the communication when um, there are changes, who they're communicating to and who we should be communicating with at Butler's. There's quite a few individuals who work there that um, communicate with schools. And then um, continuing to ask Butler's to give us good documentation when there are incidents on the bus. Adam has a question. Uh, just remind me of what what is the criteria for determining actual stops? I believe there's a list on the Mountain Views website that on the bus transportation page that describes the criteria about the safety of the stop and the distance between the stops. Um, I could search and try to pull that up. You know, I think right now I've got it pretty much committed to memory. So, uh, yeah. a student, so uh, there should be around about a mile between stops. So there's a half, you know, so a student isn't walking more than a half mile in either direction. Um, location of the stop. So if it's on a busy road, 106, five, you know, where there's major traffic and there's no uh, sidewalk, that's when we consider a stop. What else, Raina? We run this back and forth. 
Those so are the, the primary common use. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So we're trying to spread the stops about a mile apart, and we're trying to make sure that um, that if a stop is located is requested that and it's added, it's typically where it's uh, lots of traffic that are passing and it's not safe to walk on the side of the road. All right, so at least a mile distance and uh, lack of sidewalk or ability for a child to walk to the next stop. Correct. Okay. There's some, you know, there's some other cases. I mean, Raina and I speak up and I think we, you know, after our first year, this is our second year. I think families understand the priorities. Um, we're not receiving the requests like we used to. Um, but we're also, I mean, there are situations specific to a family and location that are taken under consideration. And we've had families advocate well, and we've supported that addition. Thanks. Uh, Corinne? I was curious, um, following on last spring, when I feel like we heard about, you know, current concerns about lots of, you know, incidents on buses and stuff like that, what you've heard this fall in terms of, you know, sort of how the behaviors have been on the buses and how, the, um, you know, the drivers or, or there's other ways of, of handling um, any things that have been going on on the buses. Anybody here? Bus? Much. incidents in terms of students presentation of behavior on buses but the same as usual yeah there's always issues on the bus and 99 percent of them come to us from students or families not from the drivers it's good that they're watching the road yeah we've worked with about you know there were some concerns about whether bus drivers were trying to handle the situations and sure. you know we've really been clear with the bus company that we want to partner with drivers. If there's an incident, please inform us. Keep us aware. We will address it as soon as we hear it. And based on the reports I see from principals and Alma, um, that's what's happening. As soon as there's a situation, students are interviewed. We speak with the bus driver. We ask for any video that might happen um, and then address it as quickly as we can. I okay. have my hand raised. Do you all mind if I speak up? Go right, go right ahead. That diversity hand always gets me in trouble. Um, I can say from our experience, uh, my son's been having some issues on the bus and it sounds like uh, middle school, high school students and he's at Prosper Valley. Um, <clears throat> it, it sounds like it's some um, um, students that are getting bussed in from other towns that are, is like the early pickup of the, I wanna say Woodstock three that then picks up students in Reading. Um, and it's been difficult because he doesn't know these students. So he doesn't have names that he can share with us to report. I can say that there was one um, specific incident that um, was held amazingly um, by uh, Dr. Cinquemani and uh, it ended up going up to Mr. Tancredi as well. Um, and I was really impressed at how that was handled. So I appreciate that. And also, yes, the bus struggles continue. Anybody else? Yes, Josh. So going on the fact that we're trying to drive uh, up enrollment for the new school, and now we're seeing that we have problems with full buses. I'm just curious on how that's going to pan out. I mean, let's not make a bigger issue of we don't have enough buses to handle as soon as we have now. Well, um, Jim and I have had some conversations. You know, if we are able to at least the number of kids coming from uh, Stockbridge and Rochester area. That would allow, we developed some ideas from other routes. So it's about $60,000 per every additional bus, right, Jim? 65 next year. Right, so that's three students. So for example, if we could add some students from those sending towns, we could then have a route that starts at Pittsfield, scoop up those students, come around, pick up the barter students. So we've been planning for future if we have increases um, we looked at adding more students from Ludlow. We've picked up a few. We increased it, you know, went more deeper into Ludlow. We've gone deeper into Wethersfield. We've gone deeper into Heartland. And so as we see increases, we're able to work with the bus company and add. But we're really looking at those trends. And they've been great in terms of here's some other ways to think about transportation to be as efficient as possible. But it's expensive, Jim. So this, this year, we extended the route into Ludlow, which added about four or five miles on the trip, so not a big extension. And we picked up three students. 
So that in and of itself paid for that extra time mm -hmm. and everything. What time is the pickup in Butler in the morning? I'd have to look at the schedule. It's um, all of our runs are under 45 minutes, but I don't know the exact start date of time of each one. Um, but it did obviously adjust things. Um, Gary, I think a little bit of my uh, my presentation about the budget because I have added a bus to next year's budget. I don't know where that bus is going yet. I have ideas, and Sherry kind of talked a little bit about the idea we're talking about, but it may need to go somewhere else depending on um, you know what ridership looks like and on some of the other bus routes. But right now we're looking at. Um, Going down, going to the other side of Killington, about three or four miles, and picking up some students coming this way, pulling Pittsfield off the Killington run so it won't be so full. And as Sherry said, running it from Pittsfield through Stockbridge and out through Barnard and, pick, and picking up students, which will lighten the Barnard Bonfort run. And, and it'll, it'll allow us to address some, if not all, their concerns. So then, as far as overcrowding that Maggie brought to uh, present the, this evening. So yes, we're, I've been working with um, Butler on this for six months. Um, one of our board members suggested we do some of these things, creative things, and we're starting down that path. So um, it doesn't happen overnight, but we're getting there. Again, three more students essentially pays for the cost of the bus, five makes it comfortable. Yes, right. Uh, I'm just curious on when we, the second our kids get onto the bus, or when they get off the bus, they're technically in schools protection or prevent, or however you want to word it. So I'm just curious on how much the bus drivers are actually relaying incidences opposed to why the kids or the parents have to bring it to their attention. I don't know saying shit about uh, stuff about the bus drivers uh because their job's hard enough but if you got up to a 45 minute ride in any direction is basically being unsupervised with various age groups of kids and so many issues are happening there's a lot of younger kids <clears throat> that are whether it's directly or indirectly affected by older kid behavior stuff like that I'm just curious on our plans to make these incidents less often or how we're going to win it down at all, or if we're just happy as a board saying, Bustle, they're a bitch, and this is where we're at. I mean, that's sorry, my language is horrible. That's, that's the best <laughs> I got for you. Like, are we just happy with how many incidents there are on the bus? Or what is there that we can do when we want to change it? Because if it's only three kids to make a route financially possible, can we add another bus to some of these overcrowded areas that maybe thins it out a little bit? And make some Add some tuition students to it if we can. Okay. Well, I, Aaron, do you, I mean, you have the fifth, sixth grade. There's yeah, I mean, I can't answer the you know bus driver's perspective or experience, but Ryan, you know, when families and kids bring concerns to my attention, we look into them well, very I'm thoroughly. I, 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 unfortunately, my experience is, is that the vast majority of issues that happen on the bus come to me from students or parents, not the driver. Yeah. Um, once in a while, they do. Um, and we follow up with those the same way. I, I can't answer your question directly. I don't know how to answer it, but that's been my experience in the past couple of years. The vast majority of things that we look into that happen on the bus do come from students that report something of concern or families after they've had a conversation with their kids. I think that that's great community, right? It's school relationship. That's wonderful. And I, I can't speak to why a driver isn't aware or if they should be aware. I, I, I don't know. I, I'm going to sell our questions to yours. I again, my comment about drivers paying attention to the road is not sarcastic. It's true. They're paying attention to the road, and maybe they're not looking in the mirror as much as yeah. And I, I don't know. And I didn't want to put blame or anything on the bus drivers. I was just more making this question on how do we make it more suitable, such as thinning out the buses so it's easier to manage. 
You know, it's, it's good. My Woodstock three, when it leaves Prospect Valley, there's six seats that are three to a seat on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So, you know, mm -hmm. uh, by the time they get to West, five minutes, a few miles later, I'm sure that thins out. Because uh, a lot of students get off that bus and pivot to other places, Reading, like we just talked about, and other buses. But yeah, for those few minutes and a few miles, that bus is a lot of kids, I, more so in the afternoon than in the morning. But yeah. And I would say, I, I think Killington is an example. Um, Cody is, was on the call. You know, when we had reports, students were concerned, Cody was riding the bus, Tom was riding the bus. So, really, that accountability, bringing it back to students. Making sure you know it's the responsibility. It's the kind of things that Aaron do, does and Cody and other principals having that conversation, meeting with families, being partners in terms of we want our students to make good choices. Sometimes they don't, and we have conversations about that and hold them accountable. There have been times when students have not been able to have permission to be on the bus, and they've lost that privilege. Mm -hmm. So we've been very tight about that, um, and it's sometimes we have administrators riding the buses and seeing what's going on and having some strong conversations with students. Um, Cody, you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, I think uh, Ryan makes a great point. I think that, you know, um, unfortunately some of our bus drivers don't have the training that we have as, as educators to correct behaviors and things like that. I have seen an uptick in some incidents on the bus recently because of some new drivers that I think have a different um, strategies or you know, communication is, is more intense. So they're minor behaviors, but I am getting some more. Um, but like Aaron said, I, you know, we're talking to drivers as kids get off the bus. And if we have to, we will get on the bus. Um, but I, I do hear a lot of incidents from families and students. And we follow up on those as well as the ones we receive from Butler Bus Company. Um, I will say I've been happy with Butler's response to my calls about behavior there, they seem to be pretty reactive to those and you know, pick up when I call. So, um, but I do agree. How do we partner with the bus company and, and help, you know, relay maybe strategies to use on the bus in those environments that are tough um, and unstructured like that. And, and how can we support them? So I think that's part of what you were saying, Ryan, but maybe I was wrong. You're right. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I'd also like to mention a few times I've talked to Sinkamani. Uh, you handled everything very promptly and thoroughly. I appreciate every bit of it. So it's just more of a general question. Okay. Laura? I wonder if there's an opportunity for a student leadership role in terms of high school students. Um, I one of my student, one of my kids um, reported an incident on the bus to me and said that it was like a middle school kid with an elementary school kid, and it was a high school student who actually put a stop to it. Um, and I not not that I want them to be like you know bouncers or something, but they can provide great role models, and um, you know there there could be a, a role for high school students to step up and and uh, provide good leadership on the bus. Good idea. All right, are there any other comments or questions? Well, thank you, Maggie and principals for taking that on and um, doing your best to keep everybody safe. We appreciate it. We now have a fall data presentation from Raph and John. <laughs> Or not. <laughs> Um, so Rock and I are speaking about um, assessment in our district, and I thought that I'd start by just sharing um, the framework that we use for assessment and how to access it so you can see the kinds of assessments your students are taking. 
until dinner table. Um, so this calendar, it's our assessment calendar that everyone follows, is on the SU website under curriculum instruction and assessment. <laughs> it has um, by grade level every single assessment and its purpose and the date range during which we give these assessments. Um, you can click in any one of those and learn a little bit more about them. This is a very important document because we do have three testing windows throughout the course of the school year for benchmarking, but we have regular ongoing assessment as well for students that we want to learn a little bit more about so that we can better support them. Um, and so each of these assessments give us local information that's very actionable by our teachers. Okay. We're also going to be talking about state level testing today, which is a little less actionable, but gives us some kind of information that we can work with and learn from. This is the stuff that we find really, really important. Um, Ralph, if you could scroll up just a little bit, you can see see the link here. Yes, you're like hovering it. Yeah. This is an example of the kinds of steps that we take once we take these give these assessments to our students. If you scroll down to page three. This is an example in literacy, for example. Keep going for more. Our teachers have a flow chart of decision making that they follow with these assessments based on how a student performs. So you can see that we begin with one particular benchmark. If it's working great for them, awesome. Here are some steps you can take. If not, here's another assessment you can dig into to find out a little bit more. What we are doing is we're trying to create a local assessment system that is so explicit and refined that we can get down to little micro details to be able to support literacy and mathematics with our students. So as we're sharing our data with you today, it is a big lump sum of data that's sort of expressing what's happening district wide. But we wanted to share this document with you, number one, so you can see the assessments we're giving the time frame during which we're getting them, but also just understand that they're very actionable pieces that we're working with on a regular basis. If you heard of your students accessing win time, what I need time, those groupings or the decisions made about what students are doing during that time comes from these local assessments. <coughs> so they're very important in action. So, but ask. So what's an example of a, like a math um, assessment you give out? like? That I guess that's where I struggle the hardest. I don't know what assessment you're giving. How do I know if I can do it? I'm gonna be like, I can't do it. I'm just saying. <laughs> that's a good <laughs> I'm just saying, let's be honest. Absolutely. So, and, example, so that's the hardest part with a parent. Like you look at it, you're like, okay, so you gave my kid a student an assessment. What does that mean? Yeah. I don't know what the assessment is. Like be polar, be open. Here's what they here's the assessment they took. Yeah, I, I highly recommend connecting with your child's teacher about that. They would happily talk you through the assessment. But I'll give well, you an example. Like, I want to see the actual, like, test. That's what I'm saying. Like, there should be no reason why I can look at the test and be like, oh, well, I can't do math that way anyway. So, I like, for example, we had the pandemic. I can't do common core math. I don't know how it's taught. Like, it makes no sense mm -hmm. whatsoever. Coming from the 90s and 2000s, when I learned math, yeah. I could do the math, I'd get the answer. I don't know how you teach it with the common core thing. So, like, I guess that's what I'm saying. Like, how do I know what the assessment is to be able to help or guide so that my student does, my son does better in that assessment? Because it's not only the school that's going to do it, because you're only going to see him for a small chunk. So without the community engagement of the parents. Yeah, you bring up a really good point. We are working on, um, so can I first answer your question about what an assessment looks like? Yeah. And then I can talk about the community engagement because that is really important. You hit on a very important piece. Um, so I'd say like Forefront is an example of a classroom-based or teacher-to-student-based assessment that we give. And that is an assessment that has math questions that a teacher asks a child in an interview style and watches how they go about answering it. There isn't one particular method they have to use to answer it, but how they go about answering it gives lots of insights into how a student is ready to learn the math that needs to happen in the classroom. So it's a math readiness assessment. Um, after that's given, you can meet with the teacher. I'm sure they give you information about how your student is done and what kind of group they're in, and they can tell you about what they're succeeding in and what they're not. And if that assessment didn't give them all the information they need, they have more that can dig into those aspects. Are they struggling with the number 12 and 20, for example? 
Um, are they switching around the tubes? Um, so it gets really specific. And I can tell you, I don't think any teacher is trying to hide the assessment. So I highly recommend if you have questions about how a score came to be, that you connect with your child's teacher and they can help you understand that. Um, and so what's really important to know about that is it is an interview style. So you have the student and the teacher and they're talking and watching how the student's answering it. So it gives lots of insights into how the mind's working mathematically. It's not like a, a computer-based test where they're selecting two and, you know, it's actually getting a lot of information and insight um, for that particular assessment. Don't we have other ones as well that do other things? Um, community engagement. We do want to build out another, like, actually, we want to build out a way that the report card is usable by families to engage their students at home in the math that they need help with. So as a leadership team, we're revamping the elementary report card. It's a long process. It's taking a little while. But we hope to at some point have, here's how your student is doing, and here's linked resources that are helpful to you so you can use those at home to support your student. So I'd say for us, the best way that we can communicate home that we're not leveraging well enough at this point are our report cards. And that's what we're working on right now. We got work to do on that. Good questions. Yeah. I think that's awkward silent effort and we'll record it. <laughs> so the the we've been doing these fall data presentations for a couple of years now. I think they really started um, after COVID, and, and and so it's sort of become a little bit of a tradition. Um, and so the purpose of these presentations is to really provide a high level overview <laughs> of how we're doing as a district, um, and so to try to distill it down as clearly as we can using the different assessments that we have to to, to kind of show you like the big picture. Um, we have data where we zoom in um, on individual classrooms or schools, but, but this is really about like the district as a whole. Um, so to start here, um, I, so there's so many people who have worked on this. I, I just want to acknowledge that like Jen and I are, are up here presenting, but there's a whole team of people and all the teachers and administrators who work to make sure these things happen. So it's, I think Jen's flowcharts really kind of give an example of how complex this is and how many people are involved with this. This is a system where there are many, many people involved and many people doing a lot of good work around this. Patty Kelly, Julie Brown, Audrey Richardson, lots, <clears throat> all their interventionists. There, there, there are a lot of people who are involved with this. Um, so to start to answer the question, how we're doing, um, I wanted to start by just showing you uh, some historical trends for our star data. So STAR is an assessment which is delivered um, in grades three through 10. And what you see here is um, math on the left and reading on the right. And you'll see two things on here. Um, so there's a dark blue line, which is um, the percent of students who are making adequate growth. And this is kind of a mouthful, it's kind of a complicated piece, but basically the idea is how many of our students are making the growth that we would want to see from them. And we can talk a little bit about how that's measured. So what, so that's the dark blue line. Um, the light blue line is the percent proficient. So that's um, just this number of students who are above a certain level that we felt demonstrated proficiency on that assessment. Um, so what you see over time, you can definitely see, fortunately we started these assessments in 2019 in the fall. So we actually have pre-COVID data. And, and, and so you definitely see the effects of COVID on, on this map that, you know, the fall of 2020, was, the numbers went down. Um, but really over time, the general trend is that both of these are relatively flat. Um, there's not a whole lot of change in either direction. Um, and, and the trend is, is, is fairly consistent over time. Um, reading, um, the same two colors, the same, same breakdown. Um, you see the same sort of drop during COVID, um, you do see that the um, percent making adequate growth is starting to grow right now. This past fall was the highest that we ever had. So 61% of our students um, were making adequate growth, but the percent proficient has really stayed level over that time. Now this is different groups of students every year. So it's not the same group of students all the time. So things are changing, 
Um, but generally, these are our, our, our trend over time hasn't shown a whole lot of change. Um, I'm going to move through these really quickly and then we'll open up to questions just so you can kind of ask or you can, those of you who are computers, you can poke around yourselves, but, um, and I can jump back to anything else. Um, so just to show you um, a little bit about star math. So this is again in grades three through 10. This is one assessment. One piece that we've built in here is that we have two different filters that we can use. Um, so you can choose um, to look at male or female students and then um, free or reduced lunch status. So free or reduced lunch status is a, a proxy for, for household income and allows us to, to see how that may be impacting um, how students perform. Um, so with these filters, you can see that the numbers will really change as you toggle them. Um, so for example, if we look at our students who are receiving free and reduced lunch, 30% um, of those were demonstrating proficiency, while 48% um, were demonstrating adequate growth. If we look at our students who are not receiving free or reduced lunch, the numbers are, are quite a bit higher. This is a really common trend in education, and we see that in a lot of our data, um, but we want to make sure that we are, we are sharing that with you and that, that you can explore those, those connections as well. Um, the reading data, um, looks same sort of breakdown. Um, it, it has um, the same sort of filters, same sort of pieces. The one piece that I will note about um, our reading data is that the percent of students who are making adequate growth um, has been the, this is the highest that we've experienced since we've started this testing um, across all the different subgroups. So 61%. Um, for male students, 62% for female students. Um, so overall, good growth in, in our reading and, and starting to move in a, a really positive direction. Um, the Dibbles is an assessment that um, this year is given in kindergarten through fourth grade. Um, it's a reading assessment. Um, so this is the first year that is being given in the third and the fourth grade. In the past, we've been giving it in kindergarten through second grade. So we've expanded its usage this year. Um, again, you can see the different breakdowns um, between the different categories and, and see how um, different cohorts may, may experience. 47% um, um, compared to... Um, forefront um, is a math assessment that's given in kindergarten through fourth grade. Again, last year it was only given in kindergarten through second grade, so it's the first year that's being given in third and fourth grade. Um, Patty Kelly, who's, who, who's on the call today, can talk a lot more about what Forefront um, is actually measuring, but it, it, it's really focused in on numeracy, so it's, it's really as Patty described, it's like a readiness to learn math. Um, so you may notice that some of these percent, you know, percent proficients are, are much higher. And, and this is really showing, you know, do students have that foundation, which then opens up other math concepts to them. Um, and Patty can, can talk a lot more about that if, if you're interested. Um, and the last piece, um, so you may remember last, um, last spring, uh, the state of Vermont changed their assessment, um, their state mandated assessment from SBAC to um, they're called VTCAP or Cognia. Um, and so these are our, our Cognia results. There's one other filter that I've added here because there's ELA, math, and science. Um, so you can toggle it into that particular subject area test and then see. Um, you see that big number, like, like how many of those students were, were proficient. Um, and this measure, you know, the numbers are a little bit different. So in this case, proficient is level three or four. So we really just want to summarize it for you to kind of see like 65% of our students who take the ELA assessment were proficient. And then you can get a breakdown um, according to gender to sort of see what are the pieces that are. Um, so I think the big takeaways are that the trends have remained pretty consistent over time. We've had some encouraging results in our areas of growth, particularly around our reading. Um, but we continue to have gaps. And um, there are some 
The gaps between male and female students also exist in this. They're not as large as our gaps between students who receive free reduced lunch and those who do not, um, but they're present. And um, so we're constantly looking at this data, trying to understand and look at our systems and, and see how they can work to serve all students better. I'm happy to turn it over to questions. I'll just say this looks really slick and clickable and RAP put an immense amount of work into this and um, it doesn't come easily. So I just want to thank you. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I had a question from a school board member regarding the Cognia test and as it referred to math. And um, this board member had heard that students did quite poorly in our district on math. And um, I can you speak to that? Um, Sort of and sort of not. It, it's really it, this is the first time that Cognia has been administered in our in our state, um, and I think it's we're all kind of wrapping our heads around what is a what's in a comparison. What what is what do we expect? Um, I think given what we see with our star data, it's not vastly different than our star data. So in many ways, we sort of know some of the areas that we're we're struggling in. Um, but I think it'll take time to really see are, are there significant differences. Certainly there are you know, groups of students who, who struggled and there are groups of students who did very well on, 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 on Cognia. Um, so I don't know of any sort of like generalizable okay. trend at this point. Well, I'll direct that person to speak to one of you about it. Okay. It seems, I remember that there was a terrible rollout of Cognia and many glitches. I even witnessed people where I work just about in tears for about a week mm -hmm. over the technical problems and the late um, practice times and you know not getting things in time. So I don't even know how they can call that a valid test, but I'm not the AOE. Ben. Yeah, um, thanks guys. This is a lot of information. Um, I guess, how does this align or how do we make sense of what we're seeing here when we talk about um, you know, uh, reading proficiency, the goals that we've set as a district is 90%. Are we seeing any other than like the little movement on the, um, I guess, readiness to learn or I guess, what was it? Um, what, what do we, anything that is um, kind of insightful or actionable in terms of the goals we set there? I mean, I can take a stab at it, but yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, I think, um, so, so, so a couple things that I would say to that. Um, I think if you look at our star assessments over time, you know, you, you, we do see this trending up in, you know, 61% of our students making adequate growth. My own personal theory is you're going to see growth before you see proficiency, right? Because you're going to want students, some students are, are quite a ways below proficiency, but they may be able to make good growth for a couple of years and they may be able to get there. Um, so, I think the, the growth is really encouraging. I think that um, when you look at our, our star reading data and, and even in different subgroups, you see the percentage of students who are making growth. Um, those numbers are the highest that they've been since we've been doing this. So, so that to me is encouraging. Yeah. Um, I don't know. yeah, I'd say the same thing. And so we have some awesome goals for proficiency and determining how which assessment or group of assessments we will use to determine if we've reached proficiency is an important part of our work that we're still working on. We don't want any one assessment to be the sole determinant of whether we've reached proficiency. But we also need to be able to have data that we can, you know, make decisions and take action on, right? And so I guess we don't want that to be a moving target. If we said Absolutely. going into this thing that 68% of our third graders are, um, you know, reading or achieving reading proficiency, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but it's a number that I heard. And we'd like there to be 90%. Now I'm seeing numbers that are like 51%, grades three through 10. I'm just trying to align this to the goals that we've set. And right. And remember that our pre-K, our pre-K four teachers trained last year. Mm -hmm. So this fall, really, I mean, they began to put some of these pieces in place. <laughs> and we didn't have a curriculum that aligned with the letters training. And we're just beginning. I know Julie's on the call, coaching, seeing strategies, shifting curriculum. It's a lot of work. And I think Julie would agree, it's gonna take two to three years before our scores really start responding. If you look at you know, this right, what's showing reading fall, third grade is probably the first time we're seeing the opportunities of the work that we changed. That group's gonna move up through the time. Okay. So remember, letters training just began last, finished last spring. And so they were beginning to bring instructional strategies back into their classrooms. This fall, 
is our new curriculum. And teachers are learning that curriculum. It's not crack open the book and here's chapter four in the week. There's so many pieces to it. And that's why we're supporting all our teachers with how to use that curriculum with the late start Wednesdays. Right. It's a heavy lift. And I, I also just want to say STAR can't be the only way we determine whether our students are proficient as well. We have to have that as one of at least three measures by which we figure out proficiency. Yeah. It puts too much stake and too much pressure on that no, process. And I get it. I guess, um, and I'm, you can probably hear the frustration in my voice. This is my what, fifth year on the board and I've had COVID. Um, it's just, it seems to be kind of the same picture every time we present data. It's like, there's a lot here. We're just getting going. Uh, we'll see you next time, right? I'd like to see some actionable, you know, kind of recommendations coming out of the data. Otherwise, we're just testing too much, right? Josh? So just so I'm clear, the BT caps, is that that's standardized testing? Like the, I'm going to date myself here, the old bubble sheet that we did? That yes, it, it, an it's, idea. It, it's online and it's um, what they call an adaptive assessment. So Every every student will get a question. If you get that question right, it'll get a little bit harder. If you get that question wrong, it'll get a little bit easier. It there's some questions about how much it truly adapts, but the best the format is is they're answering multiple choice questions, they're reading passages and then writing writing essays or writing responses. Okay. And are we able to see like where our district and our students have ranked among the rest of the state? If it's all I mean, we'll roll out like our other districts or schools implementing it better, getting better overall grades, or are we at least comparing students across the state from the same? Yeah, so as far as I know, um, the state of Vermont has not released that data yet. What they have done in the past is with, with SBAC, they would release the actual data and you would see exactly sort of for this group, you'd say third grade math, you know, how did we? fit in with all the other schools across the state. Um, and that was kind of helpful because it could help you show you sort of where you were in, in, in that mix because sometimes you think, oh my gosh, well, you know, we're really struggling. And then you say, oh, <laughs> everyone in the state is really struggling on this assessment and they're, they're much off. As far as I know, they haven't released that yet. I think they will. Um, but the rollout has been super challenging and the AOE has not always delivered on the things that they have said that they will in the time frame that they have. Thank you. Who decides what score makes proficient? Is that the district? Is that the state? Is it done before the test is delivered? Is it done after the state gets all the data and like, oh, that sucks. So we're going to write it down. <laughs> right. That's, it varies from assessment to assessment. Um, I can talk to somebody. You may be able to talk to someone better than I can. I can talk to you like, on the STAR assessment, we set the proficiency level internally ourselves. Um, and we did that by taking a bunch of data and correlating a time S back to STAR and saying, okay, at what level do students need to score on the STAR in order to be reasonably confident that they are, they're going to be proficient? And so we set that bar really high. It's the 60th percentile on both STAR reading and STAR math. And when STAR was doing our setup, they, they were like, really, you want to use the 60th percentile? Because a lot of districts will, will try to make those numbers look a little bit better. We said, no, we really want to know how our students are going to do. And you know, we can take the bad, and we'd rather get the hard information and try to work to make it better. So that's how it works with that. But different assessments use different means. Cognia is different. Forefront tables are different. Um, so it really varies from assessment to assessment. It's, so it just sounds to me like BT caps is really impossible to judge at this point because you can't see, hey, well, a school in Bennington, a school in Austin, a school in Burlington, you can't compare the three, so you don't know what any of that number means to me. It, it's just the number. Yeah, I would agree. I, I think it's it's really early on. I mean, I, I think we all kind of knew when it changed that it was going to take some time for, you know, work out those kinks and then to also see those comparison pieces. But yeah, it, you get this number and you're like, okay, is, is that good? Is that bad? I, I don't know. Well, the hard parts are 65% there could be 95% if you look at the entire state. Right. So yeah, I'm with you, Josh. I, mean, I, I think that's why we have such a deep local assessment that informs instruction, because that's what's most important. 
that your child is in the class, your teacher knows where their student, what their assets are, what are their, their needs, and we're teaching to that. And that's, you know, we are lucky to have such a deep assessment calendar. Many districts don't have that. Well, that's why I asked about the other sure. assessment was, I, you're, you're, I'm unsure as to what any of the assessments we use mean because what but I, it's just hard for me to go okay well that's an assessment and like the way you're saying that the, the ones given out for reading was the question so that it's like an interview style that that doesn't answer my question either it's did they get the answer right or wrong don't care how you get there that's what proficiency is to me in math especially mm -hmm. i don't i don't care if you can show your work none of that matters Adam has his hand up and then Pat. Can I just speak oh, to Ben's sorry. question yes, just a little bit more? So the other thing to be beyond assessment data, and Jen has us using the term triangulation. So there needs to be three points in terms of really seeing if the changes that we've made made a difference. And so a group of us have been working since the summer to set some short, long, and medium goals in terms of our, how do we know we're going down the right path? Um, we're going to be sending out surveys to teachers to say, how far are you in terms of using the curriculum? How do you feel comfortable? Principals, when you walk into a classroom, how do you see it? Is there attendance? So we've set out some very specific criteria for our short-term goals. We're working on that now, our meeting on the long-term to make sure that it's not just, here's your curriculum, have fun, send us a postcard when you're done. It's really around where are all the checkpoints along the way to make sure we're delivering with fidelity. It really is, we're doing everything we can to hit that goal. And, and the strategic plan for literacy and mathematics has lots of different action steps to move us forward. That's what's new and different in your years of uh, being before. We've never gone this deep into making sure we're going down the right path as we have now. Um, and it's really been a work in the last two years having the Julie Browns, having the Patty Kelly, having these this team that I can turn to who are looking at a lot of different ways and making sure we can look in the mirror and say, we've done everything we can to make a difference because that's, we have to be accountable to our students. All right, Adam. Yeah, I think I'd want to actually echo what you're saying, Sherry, and um, commend, you know, uh, uh, and Jen and, and the team. Um, that this is we're, we're getting like the 30,000 foot view right and I what we don't have insight into is how this data is actually being used by teachers for students individually to respond to where there's areas of need and to reinforce where there's areas of strength um so I can appreciate from a, a higher level or from a board level that geez like well this is just data after data but what are we doing with it but I think the reality is um, the modern day teacher has been trained to learn how to use data and synthesize that into the interventions that they have throughout the day. So I, I appreciate that we have um, we have folks like Raf and Jen that they're dedicated to this and, and Patty and others, you know, in, in the district that um, it's it's an a appealing part of our district. Right. And uh, and part of the sales pitch, too. Um, and if you know, I'd encourage other board members to be curious about what happens around the state or in other school districts in terms of having this level of personnel and this level of information and time we put into us because it's huge. Um, and, and that we really, when we're looking at data, right, that we really are informing ourselves of what does it mean? Um, and when we factor in the range of students that we're dealing with, and I, Raph, I appreciate the, um, the modifiers you're able to provide on one of the the data is you know based on income really, and and that really speaks to the discrepancy that happens in resources, um, and something that we can't lose sight of, um, because Vermont has a huge range of what's available in terms of resources, and that significantly impacts the outcomes we're looking at. So thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Patty. Hi, everyone. So um, I'm Patty Kelly. I'm the district math coordinator. Um, and anyone who knows me knows that I will talk about data and assessment all day long. So I'm happy to answer anyone's questions. But I really think that one of the important distinctions is that um, we've, I'm really proud of these local assessments that we've chosen particularly because what I think we're doing is we're not trying to teach to a test for students to be able to answer directed testing questions, but we're actually testing what we're teaching. We're trying to determine, 
are these tests, you know, is what we're teaching in our classroom really having students develop the skills that we know that we need them to have. And so um, a lot of those tests um, are recommended not to be publicly accessible for the simple reason that we're not trying to um, have students memorize answers to a test or whatever that is. But most tests have some access to like practice questions or sample questions or that sort of thing to get the sense of what they're all about. Um, but in terms of like family support, I think a really critical piece is, you know, families can support this work by helping to support the learning and the teaching um, aspects that are happening in the classroom. And in turn, that will result in student achievement on these assessments because we are really thoughtfully aligning them. Thank you. Uh, Matt, and then Julie. Um, yes. Sure. So uh, to Josh's question, the Cognia tests do have the performance level distribution by district and by state and by school. So I would think that um, that data could probably be added to this dashboard. And, you know, just looking at fourth grade, like our district outperformed the state in math and, and literature. Um, but I was the school board member that emailed Carrie. Uh, with some concerns on some of the results. And uh, in particular, the fourth grade class at Wes only achieved 29% uh, of the class was proficient in math. And so I would ask that this data be used to um, like find the red flags, like find those groups that are struggling and intervene, do something, um, because that to me would be a valuable way to use the data uh, go grade by grade at each school, and if there's a class that seems to be well below the the average, uh, like the example of the fourth grade at West last year, uh, do something about it. I'll pass my comments on. All right, thank you, Matt. Um, Julie. Yeah. Good evening. I would like to just share a brief story about um, our data. Recently, uh, two of our high school students were invited to speak at the Stern Center for Language and Learning's 40th annual meeting. And we drove to Essex and they had a room of 60 or 70 um, board members and literacy leaders around the state on the edge of their seats. and. One of the board members asked about literacy in our district, and these young people were able to say um, that Mountain View Supervisory Union has set specific goals for reading and for math and are committed to learning around best practices to help all of our students succeed, and our young people got a standing ovation. So I thought that was uh, a nice story to share that our work is being recognized. Um, what's different is the specificity with which we're approaching um, the data and how we're responding to it. And I want to thank everyone for their support. All right, any other comments or questions? All right, well, thank you very much for that. and. I'm sure if other board members have questions, they can reach out to one of you to start out anyway. Thank you. All right, uh, Sherry is going to show us a first draft of the district calendar. Well, Matt gave me a great segue into my proposal or the proposal of our team around the uh, calendar. Um, what you'll see uh, in front of you, um, there are a group of Southeast superintendents uh, that start go all the way from Hanover, all the way down to uh, the border of Massachusetts. We meet twice a month. Um, we've worked hard as a group of superintendents to align our calendars. So if you live in Windsor and teach in Mountain Views, your children will be on the same vacation schedule as uh, the ones you're on um, that were in line with um, the tech centers. So there's lots of factors in terms of picking which weeks and then we all start about the same day and then we all have the same long vacation week. So that's why we have two weeks at winter break. Um, that's why we have the third week of April. 
But what you'll see most noteworthy is that in the month of March, we have school every single day for the month. And in fact, we go from February vacation to April vacation, unless there's a snow day, and well, that's when time to get snows, where we have seven straight weeks of instruction. We're proposing in this calendar that we no longer take off town meeting day and that we have both of our in-service days in the fall. Um, you know, Jen Staten brought to my attention, when do we most need to look at data, just as Matt was saying, as soon as we get it. So the hope is that, or the proposal is that we have our two full day in services, uh, one in October, one in the beginning of November, when, is, when we get our fall data. So that teachers can sit down at that point in time and say, these are my students, these are their needs, these are their strengths. I don't need to reteach this. They have a handle on that. But here's where I really want to focus my instruction and really have time to dig deeply into those numbers and make sure that the assessment isn't just another test, <clears throat> but as an opportunity to um, really look at how we curb our instruction, direct our instruction around the information we receive from our fall testing. So that's the recommendation. Um, I know for many educators, once April break vacation happens, we come into our spring assessment calendar, we start having field trips. So those seven weeks in a row really are an important part of really making an emphasis, whether you're in elementary school, middle school, or high school, really like to have that uh, full time period. Um, it also kind of between the winter break, two weeks off, we have one day off in January, we really have one day off in May. Um, it really makes sure that when we turn from winter break, we're really uh, focused um, on that schedule. So that's the proposal. I talked, spoke with, again, superintendents in the area. Um, no other district has town meeting day off. So Hartford, Windsor Southeast, um, Two Rivers, they've really gone away from having that Tuesday off. Um, we still would allow teachers, just as we do in November elections, teachers can you know, go to the ballots before school. We make sure that they can leave right after school so we don't have meetings if it's an election day or a town meeting vote day. So we make sure that educators and administrators have opportunity to go to vote. Um, but I, we wanted to make a recommendation that we no longer take off that Monday and Tuesday and have both in service days in the fall. Again, maximize that data and the testing time we have. Real quick on that, sorry to interrupt. Sure. I, for one, for next year, I support this completely because in November, that gives my daughter opening weekend of rival season and then that Monday and Tuesday for four <laughs> days. I was thinking it's really the, excited that, for that, that, this yeah, year yeah, or yeah. next year will pull them out. So, yeah, yeah, I did consult my son who's a hunter and I'm like, do you think it's really working? <laughs> Try to please all. Yeah. Continue. It's for the students. So. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Adam and then Corinne. Um, I almost feel like I have to dissent because uh, town meeting day, kids free uh, ski free at Mad River Glen. So <laughs> this is this is this is a big step. Sorry, sorry, Adam. You can make a family choice. Corinne, you know, <laughs> I was curious. Um, if you have heard any feedback or solicited any feedback from teachers around that particular, it's the, the town meeting day um, piece. Um, um, I spoke with the principals and the leadership team and they were supportive of that pivot. The teachers I've spoken with, they appreciate having seven weeks before April break um, to really be able to focus instruction. It's it's, you know, and again, as a high school teacher, getting that momentum after February break and, and you know, you, you have February break, you have one week of school, you have a four day, you know, weekend, and, and then we throw in a couple snow days and it's really challenging. Okay. Anybody else? So Sherry, do you need us to vote to adopt it? I'd appreciate your support, absolutely. Okay, yes. Would somebody like to make a motion? I'll make a motion to it all. Second. Okay, Brian and Ben. Uh, all in favor of adopting this calendar as presented, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 All right, any opposed? Sorry, Adam. <laughs> I think he abstained. Uh, <laughs> all right, the uh, thank you. That is approved. 
All right. And now we're going to hear about the fiscal year 25 tuition rates from Jim and Ben. This is the annual uh, Ray Rice honorary agenda item. <laughs> the uh, uh, board members may recall that uh, the past couple of years, uh, thanks to the insights of our uh, business operations manager, Jim Fenn, the suggestion to um, essentially benchmark the tuition rates that we set um, to the uh, consumer price index. And in reviewing that as a finance committee, Jim presented um, some suggested tuition rates for the 24-25 uh, school year. Um, uh, and those are based on an increase uh, that the index sets at 3.1%, uh, and they're in the board book. Um, this is an approach that generated almost no conversation, discussion, or controversy last year. We're hoping for the, a similar approach this year. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so I guess I mean we can we could do it uh, by motion. I guess there's um, you know suggested uh, tuition rates for uh, 2025, moving grades K through six from 17,000 to 17,227, um, middle and high school from 19,649 to 20,273. And then we haven't moved to pre-K um, since 2018. And the uh, recommendation of the finance committee is to uh, move that from 9,250 to 10,250, move that by a thousand. So that would be a difference that's not based on the um, consumer price index. You might get the consumer price index after that. Yeah. So, uh, um, are you want to call for a motion on that? <laughs> is there any discussion? Oh, we can yeah. motion and discussion. I just have a quick question. Is there a reason the pre kindergarten was going up basically 10%? Is it uh, compared to such a small percentage of increase for the other grades? Other than we haven't changed it since 2018, it's more of an adjustment to get back on the same schedule. Pretty, Pretty much it. Yeah. yeah. Well, it hasn't changed in you know, several years. So. All right, is there a motion to um, adopt? Is that the word we want here? Adopt the tuition rates as presented. I'll make the motion. Brian moved it. I'll second. John seconded it. All those in favor, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes. Thanks, everybody. All right. And now we will be hearing from Jim uh, with an expense budget initial discussion. First look. So we've been working on the budget uh, for the last several months. Uh, a little over a week ago, the leadership team got together and reviewed a first draft of the combined budget. So this year's a little different than the way we've done in the past. Each principal put into the budget um, their supply lines and the other lines that they control. Um, I did the wages and benefits. The principals gave me staffing needs and I accommodated every request that they have brought forward at this point. Um, Joe did his budget. Um, Gretchen did the food service budget. So each department leader, building leader has prepared their own budget and entered it into the system and we compiled it. Um, so some of the things that were, um, some of the challenges that we're running into, and we've talked about this a little bit, but I just want to keep reiterating it. We're, we have reduced funding in our Title I, our Title II, and our Title IV grants in particular. Um, the federal government is not giving as much. As much. Um, some of that is driven by our free and reuse percentages, which are down. Um, I'm not sure that our people are any less wealthy. I just think, or are more wealthy. I just think that um, with the uh, not needing to complete the paperwork to get free meals, our families in need aren't doing the paperwork, so we don't have a good measure of poverty anymore uh, by the standard that has been used forever. 
Um, one of the things we noted, for instance, is that our students all, all of a sudden become almost 10% wealthier as a group when they enter the seventh, sixth grade or the seventh grade than they are in the sixth grade because our free and reduced count for high school is about half what it is at the elementary schools. And I don't believe they're any wealthier. I just believe they're not doing the paperwork. Mom and dad aren't doing the paperwork. And so there's a flaw in the process. But in the meantime, we're dealing with this. Um, what this is causing us to do is if we want to maintain the services um, at the levels that we've been running for several years, we need to move two people, two full FTEs out of these grants and move them into the general fund budget. That's a $239,000 hit to the budget, local funds. Um, one of the things um, that we had that was really wonderful last year is Prosher Valley got a local gift. Local gift funded two positions in this year's budget but only funds one of them next year, which means if we want to maintain that level of service at Prosper Valley, um, that we need to add $96,000 to the budget and move that position into the budget, the general fund budget. Um, ESSER funds and essentially at the end of this year, uh, we were really good, unlike a lot of our neighboring communities about not putting positions in ESSER. But we do have 2.3 positions that are in ESSER. Um, 0.5 of that is half of the new assistant principal at West. That's how we were able to fund that position for this year. So part, part 0.5 of that was a response to a request from you last spring after the budget was adopted to figure out how to move forward with something. Um, these positions are ones that our team strongly believes in and wants to keep. And um, one of them is Tom Emery. Now, Tom Emery's been here a long time, but when our team at the high school got redesigned, his position got moved into ESSER, not knowing how it was going to work. It's worked really well. It's a position we want to keep, but we need to now pull it back into the general fund. Um, again, that's a $237,000 hit. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I sent out, I believe to all of you, I certainly sent it out to the finance committee, the announcement from the health insurance carrier that we are looking at a 16.4% increase in health insurance premiums. That's $735,000 to our budget. And we don't have a significant say in that. Um, your association, NEA, and the state all team together to negotiate this contract was negotiated at the state level for all districts in the state. So although we have some influence, we don't have any direct say in what happens there. Um, and we also dictate percentages that we will pay and employees will pay. So we can't even go and try to negotiate a different cost share. Um, something that happened in the last year's legislature is that the state legislature adopted a new child care tax. And it didn't sound like a lot, it's 0.33%. So it's about one third of 1% on us, and it's 0.1% on the individual employees. That one third of 1% is $55,000. So that's a new expense for us. Okay. We also have new staffing positions that have been brought forward by our leadership. Um, this includes restoring one of the pre-K classrooms at West that we cut. We, we dropped two this year. We believe we really need one of those restored, not both of them, just one of them. That's a teacher and a para. Um, Joe has asked for a half-time custodial position at West because the custodian can reasonably uh, clean about 20,000 square feet in a shift. That's about a 30,000 square foot building. And so we really need one and a half people there. Um, RAF's team, who is doing wonders, but is dealing with cybersecurity and everything else, we've added 
to the budget at this point, an additional tech member for his team. Um, there's a small increase for an interventionist in counseling time. It's not full positions, but going from 0.5 to 0.75 or 0.4 to 0.6. So small incremental increases to meet needs. And um, in Killington, um, Mary's asked for an additional pair. She's sharing a pair between two kindergarten classes and feels that she really needs one in each class. Those asks are $426,000. Um, the other thing in our budget is the board's currently negotiating with the teachers union in order to not get short, caught short on finances. I've put a number into the budget. Um, we can't use that number to determine negotiations, but if we don't have it and negotiations aren't done by mid December, when you move forward with a budget, um, we need to have something or else when the contract gets approved, we'll be hit with the full cost of that and no way to fund it. So I've put a number in as a placeholder, and that's all it is um, to go forward. At the moment, all these things are adding up to a double digit increase. Um, the guidance we got from finance at our last meeting was not double digit. It was a little bit less than that. Um, so what I've asked Ben and finance to do, and it's scheduled for next Monday, is to have a finance meeting to really focus on this budget, what the, what the do a deeper dive into these components, and give some guidance back to me, Sherry, and our leadership team as to what you feel comfortable bringing forward to the voters. But these are the highlights. Um, some of the some of the good. And you're saying this, what, after all this, what good is there? Well, we are getting fully funded our four-year-olds in pre-K next year, where this year we're not getting fully funded. So that is an improvement in our revenues. Our special ed grant is going up about $200,000 next year. So that's an improvement in our revenues. Next year is the first year of the new waiting study impact. So our revenues are going up. So it's not all doom and gloom. We're looking at five or six hundred thousand dollars of new revenues, which soften this blow. They almost covered the health insurance increase. <laughs> but I wanted to, you know, there it's not all bad news. Um, but it's it's there, and I and and I wanted just to um let you know that this is what we're working with, and uh we're not ready to bring it forward yet because we're not comfortable with what we have. Sure, and it will uh and the big we won't have the full picture until the December 1st letter comes out uh, from the state. And that's when you get the yield when yeah. the, they say, okay, here's the health of the education fund. And last year it was, it was a, um, uh, it was a, a number that enabled us to put those uh, ballot, you know, the bond articles on the ballot um, because there was some kind of breathing room there. Um, and we won't have anything like that. Uh, but at the same time, I don't know if we'll have enough yeah. room to, or do as many things as uh, are being asked. We'll have to go around in that in our financing review. Was there was there any department section or anything that decreased or saved money by chance? Or was everything just more for that today's society anyways? Um there were there were changes. Um I can tell you that because of some shifting of mostly personnel, um the reading is up less than one percent. That's not because we're doing anything different with people. It's because we have new people that cost us. Right. Um, uh, Killington, because the only position they're adding is that pair is up a smaller amount than some of the other ones where we're adding more expensive positions. Um, at the high school, it's a little mis misleading because we are moving towards taking the grounds department <clears throat> off out of the high school and making it a district level department. So we've moved the two grounds people from the high school into the district level budget. So the district level budget is up 16%, the high school's up seven and a half percent. That's not true because when you put them together, it all comes to around 11 or 12%. So, but it's just, you know, as we're moving things, 
there's some things going on in the in the background that make one look a little better or a little worse than the other. But um, right, and some of those positions. So remember, and it wasn't that long ago. Now, two years ago, we were really concerned about what was happening at the middle school and high school. Mm -hmm. The level of behavior, kids stripping sinks off, you know, bathrooms, taking doors off bathrooms. And so that's when we realigned, we added some different positions, took a different perspective. And I heard from Cody, we have not had one suspension at the high school start of the school year. So we put some new strategies in place. And we've really realized difference in terms of the culture and community at the middle school and high school. Same is true at less. You know, we had some really concerning you know, behaviors last year, resulting in the board recommending some changes and additions. And we're realizing some very significant uh, behavior reductions as a result of that. So we piloted it, we used grant money to fund it, and the grants are running out. So there really aren't any, they're minimally new. And mostly we're we're taking financial responsibility for those positions that we we wanted, we felt would make a difference, and we've seen it really made a difference. Yeah, you, you don't monetize those things, right? I mean, well, it, it's the uh, but another we all we all value them. Well, Corinne does have a question. Yeah, just a couple of quick questions. One, the um you say that the the pre-K is now fully funded. Is that or, or the four-year-old, sorry. Um, is that that they are now being counted as a full student rather than 0. 0.6 or whatever? Is that as, as a full student instead of 0. 0.4 something? Yeah, 0. 0. Oh, that's amazing. That's great. Um, so for each student who's a four year old, that's 100% increase in the funding for those those students. Yeah. That's that's awesome. I hadn't heard that that had happened. I know Sherry did a lot of advocating for that. So I'm, and that's something that I've been looking at for years and years. So that's that's amazing. Um, a quick question on the ESSER funding, two point three FTE positions, and then um, currently funded using ESSER. And you mentioned, um, you know, part of that went to the assistant principal, and then you mentioned, um, uh. Tom Emery. So, who can you say who the other? What the other? I guess maybe it's one one FTE position was it's, that was it's, F It's a point eight FTA FTE for an amazing lady called Julie Brown. <laughs> right. Okay. Great. <laughs> um, just wanted to get clarity on that. And then, thirdly, I mean, it was sort of just um. I guess echoing at least or or um sort of echoing Ryan's question whether and maybe this will happen following the finance the next finance meeting um you know if the leadership teams or the administration has sort of like looked hard at where you know are there areas in which we can you know save money to decrease, decrease budget if we want to add these things in are there areas that we can identify um you know where we can where we can find those savings and as, you spoke as, to that a little bit jim as a team we know that we have to have that conversation we have right. not had that hard conversation as a team yet right okay. um we we know it's on the agenda yeah all right thanks Matt. um as far as the losing out on the Title I, II, IV idea grants, um, that does seem like a real shame or lost opportunity if, if, if it was just parents not filling out the forms. Um, is there a way, have we thought of ways going forward mm -hmm. to a better participation rate? Um, I know like the ALMA forms are a requirement and um, you know you can't, your kid can't go on a field trip until all those ALMA forms are, are completed. So are those, could those same forms be included in the ALMA forms? Do you get like better participation it's in more ALMA? Complex. It's, it, it's, it's more complex than that. It's, it's kind of a catch 22 because where we're feeding people for free, they don't need to do well, the form. It's even more complex than that. Jen, do you want to, the algorithm for? Yeah, so they actually think of have census data. They don't look at how we collect free and reduced lunch data. So it's actually from a source that's beyond us. But it, our lack of free and reduced lunch data does have other impacts other than the title. But, but the, the state is also aware of that. 
and the state is shifting their um, way of determining poverty in schools um, because you have another form you complete when you do your tax returns now. So Matt, it, and we fought this before years ago. I think it's probably about eight years ago. We went all the way to the state saying, and it was one of our towns. We just couldn't understand how they were calculating poverty rates. And it is a federal algorithm based on the census. And it doesn't change It take every 10 years, depending upon the census data. Um, so we tr we've tried to fight it in terms of how do they calculate it. It didn't represent the student population we felt. It, it didn't look at, you know, it didn't represent free and reduced lunch in a way we understood our needs of our communities. But it's a federal, really, in terms of title, it's a federal algorithm based on the census. Is there a way to... that... Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. How does that explain that difference Jim was pointing to um, that jump from elementary or, or middle school into high school and that shift? And, and that's that's strictly gathering information for the free and reduced. It doesn't okay. address the algorithm that um, okay. Sarah's talking about. Okay. I was just going to ask you we as a district can do something uh, as more of finding out through polls at our old school or whatnot, if the kids here are eating adequately or feel like they're not. Because if it's based off a of federal program and their diagnosis of people's income, then I feel like there's going to be a lot of in between families that are federally, they make enough to not need assistance. But on a day-to-day -day basis, they might not be sending their kids adequately to school with a lunch. Uh, and I know whatever discrepancy there is for kids that don't qualify, but we find out through whatever polls or questionnaires we send out aren't getting food. Is there a way we can set up a fund somewhere in the future to make sure that the kids in our district, at least, are all being fed that need to be fed? Currently, School lunch is free. Well, yeah, I should have known that. You're, 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 you're paying for it through your taxes. It's funded through the state. And during COVID, it was funded at the federal level. And now the state of Vermont has picked up that obligation. I don't remember if it was for two years or at least just this year, but uh, the state of Vermont is picking that up. And so uh, this is year three or four now where the kids have not had to pay for their meals and they can eat. They get a portion controlled meal designed by the Federal Department of Agriculture for students in their, their age group. So they may not they may complain about not getting enough food, but it is, you know, a, a meal designed for students their age with the right fats and nutrition and everything else. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, Laura. I have a question about the um Prosper Valley positions. Um, so it, it's great that we got those gifted. Um, what was the goal of those positions? And um, in order to meet that goal, do the positions need to keep happening? Or or is it one of those, like, we needed a shot in the arm to solve some problem? Um, how permanent does that, do those positions need to be? Yeah, I think in your board book, you have um, grade size projections are actually based on the data you have now. If you look at that, you'll see in the next few years, we'll continue to have reasonably large class sizes come into Prosper Valley School. So you can do the math and divide them over two teachers and you get 20 plus size students per class, which is what we've had the past few years or less. Uh, we speak to the principals and ask about the sizes of their home rooms. The less seems to be the pattern and we wanted to try to mirror that as well. Uh, so uh, that's solving the current problem, but that will continue. So board and community would like that and something you can discuss. Uh, the social mode not being a learning coach is just as needed as the assistant principal at the at the other schools, right? It's very helpful uh, in our programming. It helps us create a system that has no gaps uh, for students to fall through socially, emotionally, behaviorally, academically. Uh, so that's a position that we use all day, every day, feet on the ground, facing students, uh, supporting students with their individualized programming, uh, we'll react reactively, proactively, small groups, uh, lagging skills, 
Uh, helps out a variety of duties as well. Uh, so we use general daily operations and continuity of service. Um, so again, positions that, as long as we've got 10, 11, and 12 year olds in the building, I would say positions that uh, I would love to keep around. One of the things that I think is important because I was asked for something I'm working on to give a list of all the newly created administrative positions over the last three years. So I went all the way back to the year we merged and came forward. And in our current budget, we have the same exact number of administrators as we had in FY18. We have not added any in the bottom line. We've reallocated. In 2018, we had three administrators in the high school board. We now have two. But we have the same exact number of administrators. So we haven't, you know, the ups and downs and in-betweens, the closing and opening up Prosper and all those other things, we have the same number of administrators. So um, things have changed. Things have moved. Uh, we've re done some reallocations, but we haven't actually added any administrative staff. And, and the positions, I think, are smart positions. I was talking to a superintendent last Friday. She's had 17 risk assessments of students since the start of the school year, with four of those being substantiated as moderate risk to safety of buildings. So what we've done is we've offered programs and interventions right at the end. I like to say upstream thinking. As soon as we see a student who's starting to struggle, as soon as we see behaviors beginning, having those conversations and not waiting until it becomes a threat assessment. Um, I don't think we've had a threat assessment this year that I'm aware of in terms of student presenting certain behaviors that we wonder if they're a threat to the school community. Um, so it, 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 it's the culture of the school. It's making sure that students are emotionally regulated enough to be able to participate in their learning and not take away from the learning of their classmates. And I, I know that's something our community and board members have brought to the leadership team. And, and what we're seeing is the kinds of positions and the way we're addressing student behavior is allowing us to have much more engaged students. Plus, you know, we're not seeing that uh, inability to self-regulate that other schools are describing as happening. Um, I think Matt has a question. Yeah, yeah, I'll be brief. So I know that the behavioral issues drove some decisions by the board or some recommendations by the board to hire some of the, well, the assistant principal at West and then the um, vice principal and SEL teacher at the high school. So the board's like very familiar with those. And now we see them coming back in the budget. You know, with the Prosper Valley positions, just based on what I know about the situation there, I think the board would have been supportive of those as well. It's just that they didn't come to the board in any form or fashion because we were taking a gift from someone on the side, but now they're in front of the board. So I think the board does kind of need to understand, you know, a little bit better. And, and Aaron just gave us a good explanation on, on the, the, the student numbers and the need for SEL. But like, I'm looking at the sentence that one position does need funded and the other one doesn't. So like, does that mean we got like a gift in perpetuity for this one position that goes on forever? Like, like, or did one position get funded for two years and one position got funded for one year? And I think the board just doesn't know anything about these gifts. So it'd one, be helpful to get a summary. Yeah, one position got funded for one year and the other one is funded for two years. So we will be back. If Iran believes he needs that position next year, we'll be back to add that position to the budget next year. Thank you. All right, any other questions around? Okay, Josh, thank you. So mine's just quick. Uh, is the assistant principal position at West the only elementary school in assistant principal position? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so I, I just feel like that may be something we need to look at closer. Why is that the only school? But that's something we can discuss later on by the finance committee, but. It's bigger, it it's the end like 300 kids. Then Prosper is it bigger than the middle school? Because the middle school is one, it's Garrett, and so that's one. So is it? It's not bigger than the whole high school middle school. So that's all I'm saying. I just I think it's something that can be done there for strategic. Okay. Any other thoughts? All right. Thank you very much, Jim. Then.
Finance Committee. Uh, we'll now move into committee updates. Finance Committee. Yeah, nothing much to um, add other than we're going to have that special meeting uh, here next week. And then we'll maybe meet again. Uh, we'll see how it goes for the next board meeting. All right, thank you. Uh, policy committee. So not as busy as this all looks. We're going to try to do the second batch, um, batch processing of this, all the second ones. So um, for second reading, we do have three that we've discussed before. The first is the uh, F4 access control and visitor management uh, deals with maintaining safe environment, school campuses, the process of dealing with visitors. So looking for this is second read. I want to <clears throat> Like a motion to adopt it, uh, to send it for adoption at the de December meeting. So moved. Second. Ryan, right. thank you. Um, I always just say your names to make sure Randy gets them <laughs> when I remember. <laughs> uh, all right. Are there any questions on or further discussion on the access control and visitor management policy? All those in favor of approving to send it to a um, adoption for next meeting, please say aye. Raise your hand. Okay. Second is uh, C2, which is student drugs and alcohol. Again, we've discussed this before. Just some updated terminology. This is uh, actually part of the BSBA uh, revisions. Um, so uh, also, want to. this is a second read, want to send it to the board for next month um, for adoption. All right, is there a motion to send it to adoption? Next time. In December. So moved. John, thank you. Is there a second? Ryan will second it. All right, thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Any questions before we vote? Yeah, it looks like we made some updates to the, um, uh, THC marijuana kind of was that based on discussion that we had at the board level last time? It was based on discussion, uh, their suggestions, yeah, just in terminology. I'm just trying to remember where we, where we were trying to go. I thought there was something that is, uh, we were discussing the CBD drinks, oh, that's what it was. CBD, uh, defined by state or federal regulation. Okay, there it is, okay. that's right. Thank you. Okay, all those in favor of sending it for adoption in December, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. That moves okay. forward. And third is C27, <clears throat> student distribution of literature. And again, we discussed this last time uh, to regulate non-school uh, sponsored literature notices on bulletin boards, physical and electronic. So we are also trying to send it. <clears throat> For adoption for the next time. Is there a motion to send it for adoption in December? So moved. Thank you, Ben. Second. Second. Thank you, Don. Any questions on that policy? Okay. All those in favor of sending it forward for adoption in December, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. 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 <laughs> Any opposed? Okay, thank you. Okay. So, as a first reading, we're going to try to do this as a, sort of a, a batch. So all of these are uh, policies that BSBA has uh, made revisions on, and most and all of them have been actually just formatting changes. There's really no change, no substantial change in content. So I would like to present A through E as. Um, ones that we would like to put in as a first read and put for adoption next time. We did review all of them at our board meet, at our policy meeting, and we discussed them all uh, individually. Second. And can you clarify, Elliot? Are they going into a second meeting or they're going to go in? Well, Rana suggested that we could go into since they are not really changing content, that we could go to the same, basically this comes first and second reading and they get put in for adoption next next month. Okay. So we we our vote would be to send it for adoption next month in okay. December. That's right. Wow, we have quite a quite a lot of them. 
to be a record. Is there a motion in favor of that? Second. Ryan has motioned it <clears throat> and seconded. Uh, all in favor of sending this group through to adoption in December, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Uh, aye. And I just want to thank everybody for cooperating with us. We have one more batch that's going to come next month. Um, and then we should be back to discussing individual policies and getting into the meat of the launch. Okay. All right. Uh, Buildings and Ground Committee, do you have an update? Um, I, I do. We, we met, um, this time we met at the um, Barnard Academy. So each time our committee gets together, we go to a different campus and get a little um, bit of a tour and um, history of the building. And we can see kind of firsthand what might be needed. So our, our next location will be um, Reading, and then we will have been to all the campuses. Um, we, we discussed the projects that are going into the fiscal year 2025 budget and focused on um, what areas need to be firmed up in terms of the cost estimates, what, which ones are priorities. Um, we talked about the RFPs that were done for the HVAC systems at um, Killington and Reading. Um, and then we talked about the current status of the, pro the project at the high school to install the hydronic heat system and to repair the boilers. And at that time, they had not started the first boiler so i think with with that i'll turn it over to joe maybe to give everyone an update on the heating system sure so uh, i'll elaborate a little bit on that so uh, we did receive uh two rfps back uh, today was the deadline or i'm sorry friday was the deadline uh we'll be opening the two rfps for killington and reading hvac improvements at our next EG meeting which i think is on the 20th uh, good news at the high school, we have a boiler up and running, we have heat. Um, we're still working our way through the project. Second boiler needs to be torn down and rebuilt, and um, the never-ending saga of the software issues, the building control system for the district, we're still uh, muddling our work out of the JCI. Uh, we're getting closer daily, but uh, I can say we have heat in all the buildings and the lights are on and folks are happy. Great. Good to hear. Um, Bryce, would you like to give an update on negotiations, hiring, and retention committee? Sure. Um, not much to report yet, but as, as Jim mentioned, you know, there's a placeholder in the budget. We start negotiations in earnest uh, next week on the 15th, or yeah, on the 15th. Um, so we'll we'll see and we'll keep everybody updated kind of where that's where that's going to go but the hope is is that we can make this happen uh fairly smoothly in the next couple months and not have it be a, a long process you know we talked a little bit about um we're all on the same on the same team right so we're we're uh, going to come at it from that angle and see if we can't get these wrapped up soon thank you um are there any working group reports yeah, I'll give a new build. Um, October 26th, uh, we had the second of three uh, building tours and panel discussions. Thanks to Joe, Jim, um, Marlena, Garen, Carrie, Aiden, uh, all were you know, presenting and doing the tour. It went incredibly well. Uh, about 60 uh, people came from uh, several different communities. I've had three different people come to me uh, since the presentation, since the tour and presentation saying, I came into this thing that said against this project and now I'm going to vote for it. So those tours are, are um, effective, I would say, in terms of like showing the kinds of challenges that we got with the building and the plans that we've taken to, um, you know, to address them. So thanks everybody who were involved with that. And I'd like to make a pitch. I sent an email out to all the board members and inviting you to um, participate in a one hour Zoom session that um, Marlena has put together to make us be better able to answer questions um, and to understand the ins and outs of the project um, and the upcoming uh, vote. So if you could make every effort to try to attend that session, it's designed to be quick, give you some tools, especially those who may not know as much about the building project as others. And um, so when you are at public meetings and people ask you questions or they catch you on the street, you at least can say, 
I don't have that answer, but this is the person you should talk to. Or yes, I can give you a little bit of information on that. So um, that is, I believe it's the 16th, Ben, is that correct? That sounds right. Um, from seven to eight at night. Yeah. So um, it's just one hour. And um, this is going to be a very important time of year for us to all have some knowledge and be able to speak to the questions or point to the right people to, to get the answers to those questions. So thank you. And I appreciate an RSVP to that email. Um, any other working groups? All right, um, it is time for us to approve the minutes from the previous meeting on October 2nd. Are there any corrections that anyone noticed? Is there a motion to accept the minutes? I'll make a motion to accept the minutes. Thank you, Josh. Any uh, second? second? Second. Thank you, John. Uh, Anna seconded it as well. Um, okay, all in favor, please say aye or raise your hand. Aye. Uh, any opposed? All right. Um, at this time, we have another opportunity for public comment. So if there's anyone from the public who would like to speak, please um, raise your hand and be recognized. Uh, yes, Tess. Um, hi, I'm Tech Belisle. I'm a senior at Woodstock Community High School, and I just wanted to take a moment to introduce myself. I'm very, um, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be here. Um, I have just like a couple things that my one of our lovely student council um, advisors has asked me to share. Um, at the moment, we're trying to work on more student engagement. Um, within our student council, we recently had a really successful um, pep rally for our championship games, which um, we really appreciated. And we also are working on a couple more um, projects within the student council that we can do to get more engagement from the students. So, yeah, thank you for having me. Well, thank you. Uh, anybody else? Oh, Julie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sorry, uh, I didn't know my hand was raised. <laughs> well, we notice these things most of the time. <laughs> okay. Um, we uh, do plan to have an executive session to um, now make the read the, the reason why that premature general public knowledge would clearly place the public body or person involved at a substantial disadvantage. So if somebody would make a motion to enter executive session under one VSA 313A1E. I make a motion. I'll second. Thank you. Okay. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All right. If you may need to take like a couple minutes of a break for the bathroom, water, uh, whatever else you may need, feel free. Thank you, Aaron. Brandon. Yes, thank you. That's a lot of stuff. Okay, no action was taken in the executive session. We are now open for uh, self-evaluation and recommendations for ourselves. Good job, everybody. That was great. That was great. That was a lot of stuff to get through, even though it was a little longer than usual. That was a lot of that was a lot of topics. I will just reiterate for real that I, even though they're not here, um, they'll see it in the recording maybe. That I, I, you know, I think we're getting closer, even though we have a little ways to go. But unlike the reporting and stuff that Jen and Raf are speaking to, and I at least like to hear about the educational stuff, even though even though, even if even if we still have a ways to go, but it's nice to have that infused in the conversation instead of just the the finance and policy stuff all the time. I agree. And I, I appreciate the opportunities to, you know, ask some questions and, you know, just sort of raise things to, to think about as a, as a board and, and, um, you know, have a little conversation at the board level about all this stuff. So, um, it's been helpful for, for me. Well, thank you for the folks who keep proposing topics for, uh, to be brought to us because that's how some of these presentations are getting at the board level. Are the specific 
a request is made or an email is sent, and then we can take that and put that on the agenda for the next meeting or two meetings down the road, depending on how packed the agenda is. So if you have other, anyone has any other topics that they think the board would be uh, good to hear, um, please feel free to keep feeding them to us. Well, I appreciated Ray's enthusiasm. Um, I, I like the way he approached his um, uh, thoughts about what he saw and participated in. And I just like the general enthusiasm Ray brings to the board. Me too. Thanks. That's really nice. I appreciate you all. <laughs> <laughs> While he's sitting on the beach, <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> motion to adjourn. All second. right. Ben has offered up a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. Third, there is a second, and uh, we are adjourned officially at nine seventeen p.m. I will text that to Rena right now. Oh,